nature. I know a few people, um, they want, they're going to want the recording because uh, I've gotten a few emails already from people that are in the organization that they say they will not be able to, uh, uh, you know, come on. So I don't know if, it's like, right. if that's going to be shared. So anybody who's registered will get a link to the recording, mm -hmm. but also isn't it now it's like a little different system, right, Amy? Like, I think it's just available on YouTube. Um, it's on the AIHM YouTube channel, even without having registered. I guess I didn't, I didn't realize that previously. Oh, I didn't know that either. Okay. I think that's the case. But in any case, anybody who has registered, uh, they will get a link to the recording when it's ready. Excellent. And you can, you know, I mean, we can also send it to other people. Peter, will you be able to read the questions at the end? Or, or do I have to open up the Q and A section and open? A and A Amy, well, yep. Oh, take great. Care of that piece of it. Great, thank you, thank you, Amy. You bet, no problem. Okay, well, we're slowly accruing participants. For... Yeah, they tend to these um. I, every time I do a Zoom call, they all tend to come in uh, slowly. Yeah, so. they trickle in. Right? Yeah, they trickle right in. So, um, okay. Well, so is everybody who's there on? We we can start. Yeah. All right. Okay. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the July meeting of the Academy of Integrative Health and Medicine's Cleveland chapter. I'm Peter Geller, co-leader of the chapter, along with Dr. Amy Sokola, uh, who is also here. And Dr. Jacob Wolf is here, I believe, as well, and he's our outreach chair. So we are really excited to have Dr. Gio Espinosa present for us tonight on integrative management of prostate cancer, an overview of what works and what doesn't. Dr. Espinosa, or Dr. Gio, as he is known familiarly, is one of the foremost authorities on this topic and an expert on integrative approaches to many other men's health issues. He is on the faculties of the Institute for Functional Medicine and the Medical School at NYU Langone Health in New York, where he also conducts his practice and directs the Integrative Urology Center. Dr. Espinosa was the first naturopathic physician to complete an internship, residency, and fellowship in urology at a conventional medical institution, Columbia University. And as an avid researcher and writer, he has authored many scientific papers and books, including Thrive, Don't Only Survive, His Signature Guide to Living Optimally Before and After a Pro Prostate Cancer Diagnosis. And my, my impression, and um, Dr. Gio, you can correct me if I'm wrong, is that when you're not working with patients, you spend most of your waking hours poring over studies on food, nutrients, herbs, nutraceutical combinations, et cetera, and their effects on prostate cancer and other male health conditions. And, um, and uh, Dr. Gio lectures internationally on science-based holistic treatments for those conditions. Um, he's also co-founder and producer of the male health website, drgeo.com, and regularly produces informative podcasts and newsletters on topics related to prostate cancer and other male health issues. And there's a lot more that I could add, but I don't want to take too much time for the presentation, which is going to be substantial. Um, I would just like to make one observation before giving Dr. Geo the floor. And that is that I really appreciate the subtitle of this talk, which is not on the screen right now, but the subtitle is an overview of what works and what doesn't. Uh, you know, of course, any student practitioner or patient for that matter certainly wants to know what works for a given condition. But I don't think it's that often that we hear about what doesn't work. And I'm thinking that's just as important because you know, who wants to waste time, money, and energy pursuing dead ends um, if we don't have to? And so Dr. Gio has done the legwork on that score as well, and we're going to hear some of his 
findings this evening. And we are going to reserve time for questions and comments at the end, as we always do. So please enter them in the chat. Dr. Gio, floor is yours. Peter, thank you so much. Thank you, Amy. On my free time, what do I do? Hmm. I do spend a whole lot of time reading scientific papers. Um, for some people, that's a, a pretty uh, unfortunate situation because <laughs> they feel like I should be doing something else. Um, but I actually enjoy staying up to date with in my in my in my field, which is urology. So I am, uh, as you mentioned, Peter, I am uh, faculty at uh, NYU. So I have the great fortune of working with amazing urologists uh, at NYU and that are experts in prostate cancer. I pretty much, the, the, main, the only oncology that I deal with is prostate cancer, and that's about 65% of my practice. So when patients come to my office and they say, look, you know, are you the right guy to help me? I said, well, if I'm not the right guy, I might as well close shop and be a bartender somewhere in Costa Rica or something, because <laughs> this is all I do. Um, day in and day out. The other 35%, of course, is most all other male stuff uh, dealing with testosterone and the male issues. Um, and, and maybe 0.1% uh, female uro urology, which is uh, things like that. But I spend a lot of time on prostate cancer. So, uh, and, and I like to think that I spend good time with my uh, family as well. So, and taking care of myself. So, yeah, no, thank you very much. That's a great introduction. Why don't we get right to it? And I will entertain questions towards the end of this presentation. Let's see here. Hold on. Okay. So disclosure, I am medical director and co-founder of XY Wellness, which is a lifestyle nutraceutical company for men with prostate cancer. That's disclosure. You know, so grading, when we, when we say what's the grade of a particular tumor, what we're saying is, what can possibly happen? So if I'm graded with a particular type of, uh, of, of uh, there's, there's staging, there's grading. Staging is, this is what I have here right now. Grading is, this is where it can go. And the, 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 the main grading system for prostate cancer is called the Gleason score. I've been asked before, no, it has nothing to do with Jackie Gleason if you're of age. Um, this was Donald Gleason, which was a pathologist, who was a pathologist at the University of, uh, of Chicago, and, um, and developed this grading system. The reason why this is important, because this, there's nothing more important than the Gleason score as it relates to the potentiality of, 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 uh, of, that, of prostate cancer and how aggressive it can be. If you've dealt with men with uh, prostate cancer, you know that they give you a Gleason score of X. That's one number, but it's really a combination of two numbers. So what they're trying to look at is they look at the result of the most common and highest, uh, obviously is a biopsy tissue that they look at, and they look at the most common um, pathology that is um, less normal, less normal to like the Gleason one. So it, it's, it's less of your normal tissue. The more, the, 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 the more differentiated it looks or the more poorly differentiated it looks, the higher the probability of high, having a higher Gleason score. Then they look at the second most, um, uh, uh, the, the second most uh, differentiated tissue and they add those numbers up. So what you typically see is either, you know, it's typ it typically goes from a Gleason 6 to a Gleason 10. The higher the grade, the higher the likelihood that um, there's either already prostate cancer outside of the gland or the probability of that cancer within time leaving the gland and metastasizing um, is high, the higher the score. So a Gleason 6 is two numbers that are three plus three, all they see is threes, you know, so that's all they see, tissue that looks like threes, so add those numbers up, that's a Gleason six. Gleason seven is actually tricky because Gleason seven can be four plus three or three plus four. So four plus three, so if they see a lot of fours, which is very irregular tissue, plus three is actually a little bit more aggressive than 
if it's Gleason 7, 3 plus 4. So when you see Gleason 7s, you want to know, is it a 3 plus 4 or 4 plus 3? 4 plus 3 are that first number that they're adding up typically dictates how aggressive the cancer is. So 4 plus 3, it's a more aggressive potential, but has more potential um, potentiality for to be more aggressive than a Gleason 7, 3 plus 4. Once you go above Gleason 7, it really doesn't matter how the numbers add up, right? So a Gleason 8 is 4 plus 4. A Gleason 9 is either 5 plus 4 or 4 plus 9, but it really doesn't matter because it's already advanced cancer. Um, and Gleason 10 is Gleason 10, right? So let's move on. So that's so the Gleason score is there's a there's a many ways to um, try to um, help men figure out what they have and how aggressive it is. Uh, the Gleason score is the most significant method or, or the most important out of all the components, including PSA, including um, other PSA density and things that we probably won't get a chance to talk about. So Gleason, the Gleason score that gives you uh, much of the information so that you can categorize where the patient, um, how aggressive the patient's disease is. The way we're going to break it down today is going to it's going to be in three categories. So when a patient comes in, they typically either have low risk disease or they typically have moderate risk, which means they've had treatment or post treatment, they've been treated with some medical treatment or they have advanced disease and probably on androgen deprivation therapy where they get chemically castrated to control the disease. That's one of the medical treatments. So how, we, how I'm gonna present it today to you is one of these three categories. So low risk, it's typically at least in six. I should add here that there is such a thing as low intermediate risk which is Gleason 7, 3 plus 4. Let me just say some Gleason 7, 3 plus 4. So if, it, if there's only a few that are positive, so when they take a biopsy tissue, they typically take about 12 picks from the prostate. If there's about two Gleason 7, 3 plus 4, that's referred to as low intermediate risk. Okay, so there's Gleason 6, low risk, and then there's low intermediate risk. Typically, the PSA in low risk is less than 10. And one of my main concerns with Gleason 6 is, is, you know, I'm glad that you're here in my office, Mr. Smith, because now you got scared with the C word, but you're at a much higher risk of dying and from a heart attack than you are from prostate cancer. So maybe now we can do something about your cancer and lower your risk of a heart attack. That's typically the conversation. Post-treatment, so these are people that have had either radiation or surgery. Yes, there are many other treatments out there, but these still to date, the main treatments for, um, for prostate cancer are uh, radiation and, uh, and prostatectomy, removal of the prostate. I'm going to refer to these as just intermediate to high risk, which typically means Gleason 10 or higher and a Gleason 7 or higher, when you are intermediate risk of Gleason 7, I'm typically referring to a 4 plus 3, not a 3 plus 4. 3 plus 4 is low intermediate risk, okay? Um, they're medically treated, not on androgen deprivation therapy, okay? So they're medically treated with surgery or something, and either they have um, no recurrence or their recurrence is um, it's low with a very slow PSA rise after treatment for prostate cancer. Okay, so that's, a, that's post-treatment prostate cancer. Then is advanced prostate cancer. In this case is um, someone with a PSA of 20 or above or a Gleason 8 or higher, likely extra, ca ex uh, ex um, extra capsular extension, which means that now the tumor is likely outside of the prostate, whether right outside of the prostate, literally speaking, or in a lymph node somewhere, or somewhere in the bones. 
So typically, so the first place where prostate cancer metastasizes to is the bone. I, I, Gleason, for, for to, tip, if we're going to go by PSA, it, it has to be a little bit higher than a Gleason 20, typically, for there to be bone metastasis. I would say probably 50 or higher, a PSA of 50 or higher. If they present with a PSA of 50 or higher before any imaging or anything, I'm suspecting some level of bone metastasis. Oftentimes, they're on androgen deprivation therapy, either because they've had surgery and the surgery didn't, it had a recurrence after surgery or radiation, or that's the first line of treatment, androgen deprivation therapy with either an androgen blockade or what's called an LHRH antagonist, all these type of anti-testosterone treatments. There are multiple of them now. It's Zytiga and uh, uh, Xtandi. There's quite a few. And Zalunamide. All right, so let's start with low-risk prostate cancer. And I'm only going to hover over the medical treatments because I think what you're interested in is in what do I do as an integrative practitioner with these men? So that's what I'm going to focus on, okay? Um, Low-risk disease, oftentimes they can, they should and can do just active surveillance, which is no medical treatment, right? They are a candidate, but for whatever reason, sometimes they, they don't, so they, they opt for treatment. Sometimes it's psychological, sometimes it's personality type. You know, if they look at the world very linearly and, and so forth, uh, I always love to know the personalities of my patients because then I'm able to kind of predict what, what they're gonna do. So some patients are the take it out person, doesn't matter what it is, just take it out. It's almost like very linear, right? Cancer in the prostate, take it out. Take out the prostate with the cancer, very linear. Other people are the other extreme. They're, they're, I'm not ever taking out my prostate, right? That's not gonna happen. And other people are somewhere in the middle. Um, but that many of the medical treatments, if they need treatment or, or if they undergo treatment for low risk prostate cancer, there's many treatments out there that are, foc that are called a focal ablation therapy, right? So some of these include stereotactic radiation, also known as CyberKnife, but CyberKnife is the brand of the equipment. So it's like saying Kleenex, they've done such a good job branding then when people come in, they say, hey, what do you think of CyberKnife? It's not CyberKnife, it's stereotactic radiation. Um, you have proton beam radiation. This is another type of radiation. And yes, while it is radiation, it's not external beam radiation, right? So external beam radiation, which is the traditional medical treatment for prostate cancer, is this beam right around the whole pelvic area, just zapping away the cancer. But now you're also taking out healthy tissue. So there's radiation exposure to the bladder, radiation exposure to, you know, just healthy tissue all around the pelvic area. Stereotactic and protons focuses in the just on the prostate and no other tissue. You have so it depends what kind of energy you want to use. So you want to use ultrasounds, right? So same ultrasound that women would use when they're pregnant to see the status of their baby. This is there's a, a very high intensity frequency ultrasound that can be used for um, a, as a treatment. Now, so you have to find and the, the, the cancer. And in a focal method, they go right at that cancer um, and leave the, the prostate intact. Something very new called TULSA, transurethral ultrasound ablation of the prostate. This is through the urethra. So HIFU is through the rectum. They insert a rod with ultrasound waves to uh, the prostate or the area of the, of the prostate with lesions. Trans, uh, TULSA is through the urethra, just in case there is... Um, there's tumors around the urethra. So it's good for localized prostate cancer that is very difficult to get with HIFU. Cryosurgery is the sort of the mainstay of focal therapy. So literally they, um, they freeze half of the gland and literally they freeze it to, to ice balls. Like I think it's negative, I, I forgot the numbers, um, but very, very cold. And as I said, no medical treatment which is oftentimes the case. So when patients are asking me, what should I do? 
I said, you should do nothing active surveillance or what I call proactive surveillance, meaning get on this protocol that I have and we'll monitor you. But understand that if you choose to treat your, your prostate cancer, you're doing it for psychological reasons, not for physiological reasons. So that's the conversation there. Okay, low risk diet. And of course, everything that I say will have um, scientific evidence or backing behind it. So what's the goal? The goal is to reduce the risk of prostate cancer progression and prevention, but also reduce the risk of other probably more life-threatening th chronic conditions like a heart attack, right? So the likelihood of, of a man dying uh, from prostate cancer with low-risk disease, it's not too high. They're going to die with it, not from it, okay? So I'll share with you the research that uh, I'm familiar with, and then I'll share with you my approach towards the end. Um, so there was um, a, a randomized trial with men on active surveillance. So those that increased their vegetable intake did not reduce the risk of prostate cancer. Well, they didn't reduce the risk of prostate So they were not, they were not, these are a group of men that were not, um, were not diagnosed with prostate cancer. The reason why that's important is because most men, if they live long enough, they're either gonna die with prostate cancer or from prostate cancer. So I am not that interested in knowing what increases the risk of prostate cancer or lowers the, or, 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 or yeah, I'm not that interested in what causes a, an increased risk of prostate cancer. I'm interested in only what causes an increased risk of that advanced prostate cancer that can potentially kill me, right? That's a big difference because these indolent, suspicious, aberrant tumors in the prostate, that's probably gonna happen with time. That doesn't matter if it stays put and doesn't bother anybody. So that particular study showing that increased vegetables didn't reduce the risk, it was like, okay, what are we, JAMA too. So, like, okay, what are we trying to do here? Now, Mediterranean diet was more protective in another study in men on active surveillance with Gleason 6. So those that were on this Mediterranean diet had less risk of, at, uh, of, of uh, progression of their disease in this study. And some prospective studies show that a plant-based diet lowers the risk of the Gleason grade. Uh, uh, and I'll tell you my experiences in that regard later on. Um, substitution of 10% of calorie intake from carbohydrates with vegetable fat. Now vegetable fat, it's key here, uh, could lower the risk of lethal prostate cancer by 29%. Okay, so um, I think that um, actually I'm going to hold my thoughts on what I think uh, diet wise because I want to make sure that I bring it home and I'm very clear as to what you should recommend. So bear with me on that. Um, in terms of exercise, right? So what kind of exercise should I recommend? Um, the goal, again, is to reduce the progression of of uh, to reduce prostate cancer progression and also reduce the risk of other conditions. High intensity interval training, which is this methodology of, in this particular study where um, the, the group that, so they looked, this is a randomized trial, the group uh, that did hit on a treadmill. So they went really fast for about uh, 30 to 60 seconds. And then they slowed down for one or two minutes. They did that five to eight times. Right, so go really fast, almost to maximum heart rate on a treadmill. It's almost like a sprint, 30 to 60 seconds. Slow down to a walk, five to eight times. And what it showed was that it decreased PSA, it decreased PSA velocity. So I'm not gonna talk a lot about PSA. We know the controversy there, but it's not so much the absolute number, it's more about the velocity, how it changes with time that matters. And when they removed the blood from both groups and they poured it on a Petri dish of, can of prostate cancer cells, the Petri dish of blood that consisted of the men of the experiment, uh, from the experiment that, that did the HIT workout, you saw regression of prostate cancer cells there versus the control group, which showed no regression. OK? 
Okay. So I do recommend some level of hit if the person is able to do it. Um, typically, um, people are able to do it to some degree, even with some limitations, because you could do that on a bicycle, on a stationary bike as well. Just go fast, then go slow, go fast, go slow. Um, I usually have them get a stress test before they do that to make sure that I'm not stressing their hearts uh, more than they should. So that, and I include HIT as um, for them to do it about once or twice a week, because I have another it's a whole exercise program. So, but HIT seems to be very important. Anyway, the third bullet point says, men followed for 20 years found that vigorous exercise and other healthy habits reduced the risk of lethal prostate cancer by 68%, okay? Um, this particular study by the group at UCSF um, showed that the combination of lifestyle medicine worked well, but they, but they saw that vigorous exercise was a huge contributor to the outcome of lowering the risk of 68% of that of lethal type of prostate cancer. This is important because patient comes to your office and you give them, you're giving them everything. Get on this diet, exercise like this, sleep like that, stress management here, these supplements, overwhelming, overwhelming. Um, it, the process in my experience is six months to 12 months for them to do a whole lifestyle. It takes that amount of time. And if I have to start somewhere, I say, look, get the exercise in. And then from a dietary perspective, uh, eat less, not change your diet at least now, but eat less, practice some level of intermittent fasting and let's get the exercise down. It's what I recommend. Um, nutraceuticals. Um, so I do recommend green tea. Everything that I recommend is in a formula. It's not the only thing I recommend, but I recommend a couple of things. Green tea extract. So in a group high, uh, in a group of patients with high grade pin. So high grade pin is a. These are pre-cancer cells. About thirty percent become cancerous within time. So they look at a group of people with high grade pin supplementation and they supplemented them with uh, green tea uh, catechins and green tea extract. And it showed that it stabilized PSA and uh, reduced uh, the risk of prostate cancer only in the group, sorry, there's a typo there, only in the group that took the green tea extract. Um, another systemic uh, systematic review concluded that green tea is an effective chemo preventive agent for prostate cancer patients. Again, another typo with, you know, with um, with prostate cancer patients with low risk prostate cancer, that's what's missing there. And another study showed that a blend of pomegranate green tea and broccoli extract and curcumin slowed PSA in a men of inactive surveillance. Again, it's not with PSA is not a matter of what's that number is can we slow the velocity? And that's one indicator. Okay, in this particular group, the best way of no the really the best way of noting whether or not uh, how effective the treatment is, is you get them on a program. And unfortunately, if you really want good information, they have to get an MRI and then a biopsy. That's sort of the, the way. And, and that, that will give you um, the best information. Obviously, in my practice, I don't want my patients to be overly biopsied because one thing is for me to have, want to know how they're doing objectively from a scientific perspective. The other thing is like this constant invasion of the body and you know poking the prostate. So I try my best to um, keep them away from the needle as much as possible. Not acupuncture needles. I encourage acupuncture needles, but I keep them away from the biopsy needle as much as possible. So for low risk, um, these are the nutraceuticals. Um, uh, cruciferous vegetables uh, tend to lower uh, the risk of uh, prostate cancer progression by 59%. So I do recommend the broccoli, cauliflower, and Brussels sprouts and all those cruciferous vegetables. If they have to choose a vegetable, the king of vegetables or the queen of vegetables, for prostate cancer is cruciferous vegetables. 
as best as I know, is better than carrots, though you can eat carrots and it's fine. As best as I know, it's better than uh, pretty much all the other vegetables. So cruciferous vegetables is the way to go. So saturated fat. So high consumption before prostate cancer diagnos uh, diagnosis was associated with higher prostate cancer mortality. I'll explain why, or at least my hypothesis in a little bit. Poultry with skin was, uh, uh, and more than six eggs a week increased the risk of recurrence. So I just tell my patients who love eggs and they were on a paleo diet, um, no more than six eggs a week. Is it the yolk? Is it the, is it the protein? I don't know. There is some information, um, scientific information that suggests that choline, which is a very important mineral for, for brain health, as you know, might be a contributing factor at high amounts to prostate cancer and prostate cancer pro progression, choline. So maybe a scenario where if it's a little bit of is good, more is not better, I don't know. Um, and most, most of the choline in the eggs is in the yolk. Again, I think that yolk has other healthy things to it. So I tell them, look, um, you know, half, you know, no more than six eggs a week. Um, you, for whatever reason you choose to have more, do it without the yolk. Just, yeah, you because know, I don't really know what, what else could be a contributing factor in eggs. I know that there's some information that, um, you know, all kinds of amino acids, you know, if you look hard enough on the internet, carbohydrates increases the risk, fat increases the risk, amino acids from proteins increases the risk. So it leaves us with just eating, you know, inhaling air and eating vegetables, I think, right? So, um, and it's, we want to make it easy for patients. So I, I try to give them some um, very, very um, scientifically guided guidance. Poultry without the skin, I don't know what it is, but that's the, you know, that's the, the skin typically has a lot of the fat. And I think it probably has to do with fat, the fat of, of the chicken. Obviously, fat also is involved in, um, you know, fat holds all the toxins that we are all exposed to. So most of our toxins are in our fat. So maybe there's something there in that regard. But that's what the research shows with low-risk prostate cancer. All right. So how about guys with um, after they're treated? What do we do with those guys? Okay, so the goal here is to re re reduce the risk of recurrence or slow down PSA if they've already recurred, right? So slow down the velocity. We're trying to prevent them from that next treatment. The next treatment is androgen deprivation therapy. Or the next treatment is if they had surgery, the next medical treatment might be radiation combined with androgen deprivation therapy. So I'm trying to prove lower the risk of them needing um, any of these treatments, okay? So systemic meta-analysis show fish and vegetables were associated with lower risk of cancer mortality. Um, alcohol was associated with high cancer mortality in a group of um, patients with prostate cancer, okay? Um, so I do recommend fish and vegetables. Um, in terms of the fat from the fish, to me, it's pretty clear that uh, at this point anyway, that um, omega-3 fatty acids are not, not only not a problem for prostate cancer, but it is beneficial for prostate cancer. Um, and um, most of the studies show that fish, particularly salmon, so what they call color fish, is protective in comparison to whitefish, right? So um, um, salmon seems to be the king or the queen of fish as it relates to prostate cancer, okay? Um, the other study, the third point, shows two servings of fish per week after diagnosis was, was, was associated with 17% lower risk of prostate cancer recurrence, right? That is pretty nice. Now, if that's 17% here and 
some percentage as we're going to see from exercise and perhaps some percentage from certain nutraceutical supplements, you can significantly lower the risk of recurrence of prostate cancer uh, when you combine as many of these elements as possible. And that's the goal. Exercise. So anything above about nine or 10 metabolic equivalents or METs um, suggests that there's higher intensity, right? So anything above nine or 10. So 17, above, uh, anything above 17 in this particular study of METs per week of recreational physical activity compared to much lower intensity, right? Anywhere between three to eight was associated with a significant um, lower risk of prostate cancer specific mortality. 30%, 37. So intensity matters. Okay, intensity matters. So what I would suggest is so the way I talk about exercise to my patients and the way I prescribe it is that there's physical activity. A lot of the studies talk about physical activity and that's not great terminology. Physical activity is literally like, you know, anything. Like you get up from the couch and go to the bathroom. That's physical activity. There's physical activity, there's exercise, physical exercise, and then there's physical training. There's three parts. So I want you to be in a full spectrum. Um, and I want, and then I'm very specific depending on what I'm trying to, uh, the type of prostate cancer patient that I'm dealing with. So if I'm dealing with somebody on active surveillance, I want to make sure they do hit once or twice a week, plus some weight training, plus any type of other activity. Maybe they're ready. Maybe some of them play tennis or, you know, I want them to do the activity that they enjoy for sure. But I'm also wanted to, I want them to do the activity that I know can create this micro environment that's hostile to cancer, right? So and, and if they're in low risk, uh, hit, tell them hit to do hit. If there are uh, prostate cancer treat, uh, post prostate cancer treatment, you can incorporate hit. That's intense intensity there. I just want them to have moderate to high intensity, about three to four hours a week. That's the goal. Moderate to high intensity, three, four, almost whatever you want to do. So um, almost whatever you want to do. Because sometimes um, um, either they have a wearable where they can me measure their heart rate or something. Uh, that tells me or tells them that they're at the right intensity level. So intensity matters is what I'm trying to say. Third bullet point, men who walk three or more hours a week at a brisk pace, a brisk pace, you know, like these New Yorkers that come to me, say, oh, I exercise. Oh, yeah, what do you do? Ah, I'm a New Yorker, so I'm always walking around. No, 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 no. The worst is when they say I play golf and that's their form of exercise. So like, you know, you take the cart from one hole to come on, who you're fooling. You know, you. what are you doing? So you really have to dig because it makes all the difference in the world. So brisk walking is you're moving your arms pretty in a kind of 90 degree angle. It's almost like you're jogging. It's brisk walking at three to 3.5 miles an hour. Another way of trying to figure out what brisk walking is or what's three to 3.5 miles an hour is get on a treadmill and put it, put it for three miles an hour. And you'll see what that feels like. So it's not a slow, just passive pace. So, and it's three, and they did notice more, it's more is better. So what I tell patients, I want you to be four to six hours a week of exercise, training, and some physical activity. Uh, try to hit six hours a week. I just, I really believe exercise done right is probably the most essential form of medicine in men with prostate cancer, right? So I spent some time on that. Anyway, so men who walk three or more hours a week at a brisk pace had a 50% lower risk of prostate cancer recurrence compared with men who walk less than three hours per week in an easy pace. Okay. So now 57% um, percent here, 27, uh, 17% uh, there with more vegetables and fish, you know, nutraceuticals, you really increase the odds of, you know, not dying from prostate cancer. 
and a lot of other trickle down health benefits that I think our patients will enjoy. Um, more on exercise, it's just, um, and by the way, if you want, um, I have a whole sheet on, on references and my recommendations that's even more specific with more. So I can send that to you. Um, if you go to drgeo.com, drgeo.com, which the website is actually down, but there's a way of putting in your email. If you put your email there, I'll send you that PDF on very specific um, exercise instructions. So um, drgeo, drgeo.com. You're going to see a page because our website is down. It actually, uh, due to the uh, the Dr. Geo podcast, has gotten so much attention uh, that uh, it crashed. So the server crashed. So I guess that's a good problem, but here we are trying to rebuild our website. So drgeo.com, there's a, put your email there and I'll, I'll send you um, a PDF on very specifics on exercise. Um, in any event, uh, making sure that I tend to run out of time. Um, so there's another study, 70 year survival rate with men who survived at least two years were more physically active after diagnosis than those that um, um, uh, who were um, uh, lo lower risk, uh, sorry, men who survived at least two years were more physically active after diagnosis uh, uh, and was associated with lower risk of prostate cancer death. This is a 17 year study. They're again, emphasizing the importance of exercise. And lastly, uh, and men who were followed with vigorous exercise. Actually, that's the, um, uh, that's the Kenfield study that we went over before. So we're gonna skip that. Nutraceuticals for uh, post prostate cancer treatment. Uh, fish oil, so fish oils, fish oils taken for four to six weeks prior to surgery inhibited prostate cancer tumor growth um, after the surgery. So they actually saw this on the actual prostate. So they took fish oils four to six weeks prior to surgery, and there was less cancer after the surgery um, that they saw that they saw in the prostate cancer tissue itself. So I think I do think that fish oils and um, have many benefits. Again, cardiovascular lowers inflammation. I came across a study that uh, fish oils might contribute to protein synthesis in muscle, so might contribute to muscle synthesis. And that's very important. I'll tell you why later. So um, I'm a huge fan of fish oils. Obviously, lowers triglycerides and uh, good for cardiovascular health and so forth. Men with biochemical recurrence of prostate cancer studying agaricus, white button mushroom powder therapy was associated with a decline in PSA levels, 36%. So they already had biochemical recurrence. They were treated. They had recurrence. And only the men who took agaricus um, had a lower, uh, a decline in PSA by 36%. Now, Geo, I hear PSA doesn't matter. Why are we talking about PSA? If it doesn't matter, why is that a, a method of determining if the treatment is working or not? PSA prior to diagnosis of prostate cancer is tricky. I think it is helpful but it's tricky. You have to look at velocity and other things. PSA after diagnosis, particularly after the prostate is removed, is actually a better indicator of progression of prostate cancer after and recurrence after treatment than it is before treatment. So a PSA decline, in this case of 36% with the garicus, it's a darn good thing. Oops, I didn't know that was gonna do that. All right, yeah, so Randomized trial, last bullet point, prostate cancer patients who had a rising PSA level after radical prostatectomy were treated with 60 milligrams of sulforaphane or placebo. Sulforaphane, of course, found in cruciferous extracts or broccoli extracts, supplements, uh, or placebo. PSA increased significantly in the placebo group compared to the sulforaphane group. The, the PSA doubling time, okay? So the doubling, you want a um, you want a uh, um, you want the doubling time to be longer. So literally, if uh, I'm pulling these numbers out of the air, if your patient comes in, his PSA is two after a prostatectomy. Let's just say you want by the time that PSA becomes a four, you want it to be as long as possible. So if it goes from a two to a four in three months, 
that's a very, that's a three month uh, PSA doubling time. That's very quick and that's not a great sign. If the PSA doubles in a year, two years, so it goes from two and then a year and a half later is a four, that's a slower 18 month doubling time. That's a better scenario indicating, you know, that is less likely that the patient will succumb to prostate cancer. Okay, so the longer the doubling time, the better. So anyway, so patients who took 60 milligrams of sulforaphane had a much longer doubling time. Um, so it was 86% longer in the sulforaphane group than the placebo group. So um, any type of um, broccoli extracts with glucoraphanins and things of the sort, I, I recommend. I, I recommend uh, in, 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 in supplement form. Advanced prostate cancer. So the goal here is to reduce progression and and minimize adverse side effects. So to me, one of the things I'm most concerned with is them dying from some um, adverse event from uh, androgen deprivation therapy, from chemical castration. So, sorry, it's a matter of, uh, you know, what's the trade-off, right? So you lower your testosterone, great, but now I increase my risk of other things. So, and by the way, I, I don't, so they come and they say, look, I'm, and I'm on androgen deprivation therapy. My job is not to say, get off of that. That's horrible. Your job is to support them and not confuse them more. And the truth of the matter is that they could live a very long time with very good quality of life if they follow these instructions. Okay. What do I mean by that? Not, they're, not only they're alive, they're functional. They, they, they go to work. They feel great. They have some hot flashes at night, a little more fatigue. but Overall, they're doing great. And they do even better if they follow the suggestions that we're about to um, go through, okay? So red meat increased the advanced prostate cancer found associated with high intake, not of just regular meat, a grilled beef, well done beef, and well done hamburgers. Well, GEO, we all know that meat is bad for prostate cancer. Says who? Now, I'm not paleo, I am not paleo, Valio or any alio, right? So I don't have much of an ax to grind here because this notion of these diet wars, uh, you know, becoming religious are, are you know, it's just, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's crazy. Everybody wants to be part of a tribe or something. So you could be vegan, whatever, but I'm just, just like I'm saying that, you know, consumption of soy is not bad for men because this notion that is estrogenic and increases, you know, estrogen in men, no, that's hogwash. I'm not demonizing soy and I'm not demonizing red meat. The deal with red meat is indeed the fact of how it's prepared, according to other research. So there's no evidence to show that red meat increases the risk of any type of prostate cancer. There is evidence to show that red meat increases uh, or grilled or red meat cooked in high heat does increase the risk of prostate cancer. So that's that. Um, so some of the other points there, overall inconsistent associations between intake of meat and meat products and the risk of advanced prostate cancer. It, it, it is incons inconsistent because the devil is in the detail. The other part of the story is that, um, processed meats are also seem to be a problem like cold cuts that also shows an increased risk. Okay. Um, their inverse but insignificant association was detected between intake of total unprocessed red meat and the risk of lethal prostate cancer. Okay. Why is this important? The number one concern I have with men as they get older across the board with prostate cancer without is sarcopenia, muscle wasting that comes with age. Right? So the trickle down effect, the metabolic trickle down effect that happens with having little to no muscle or strength, physical strength. The trickle down effect that happens as it relates to bone health and the increased risk of osteosporosis because of muscle mass. The increased risk that happens from falls and loss of balance because of 
low muscle volume, low muscle weight. The increased risk that happens from if you actually need to be bedridden from a surgical procedure and your baseline muscle is really low and now you're in you're bedridden for two to four weeks that you lose muscle really quickly and you don't have enough stored to have a decent baseline to then bounce back from the surgery or the effects of the surgery and being and from being bedridden men need to conserve and um uh, muscle i'm not saying yeah you're not you're not going to be arnold schwarzenegger it doesn't really matter what you do but you need to have muscle. AD, so there's three methods of this three um, methods of keeping muscle or stimulating protein synthesis in muscle. One is weight resistant training. Two is testosterone. Three is amino certain amino brand chain amino acids, especially leucine is very important part of, um, of muscle and protein synthesis, leucine, valine as well as the branch chains, but leucine is very important. If that's the case, why would I re recommend my patients on advanced prostate cancer not to eat meat? Maybe that is their method of getting their amino acids in, right? So if they get the right type and they don't overcook it, go for it a couple of times a week. You can get it from salmon as well. Now we know that salmon helps across the board, right? Um, now, if somebody's vegan, my, I'm not interested in changing people's ways that much. So I would recommend, for example, if they're vegan or just plant-based and vegan plant-based, I do recommend to, for them to take brand chain amino acids and pills in pill form. Okay, but the bottom line here is these guys on ADT, they lose muscle very quickly unless they do something to retain and sustain um, some of that muscle. And part of that something is definitely, if they're not gonna have the testosterone part, they're gonna need the amino acids and they're gonna have to do weight resistant training. Okay. Uh, fat consumption, saturated fat, um, is significantly associated with an increased risk of advanced prostate cancer. Monounsaturated fat, polyunsaturated, linolenic, and linolenic was generally not associated. So something maybe with saturated fat. I, I, again, I know there's a, the keto, my keto folks, raise your hands if you're a keto person. I mean, I love you too. No problem. What I would say is that a ketogenic diet and I know what you read. I have the books behind me. How ketogenic? I know so many of them are my friends. Ketogenic diet for cancer. I get it. I see these patients all the time. Okay. I'm on a ketogenic diet because I read metabolic book by Nasha Winters. I mean, did, did, did. What I would say is that not every cancer is created equal. Not every cancer is metabolically the same. And what people, including you, practitioner, what you decide to do is also extrapolate. So if there's a study that shows that ketogenic diet is good for glioblastomas, brain cancer, you're saying, oh, it's probably good for prostate cancer. And I'm saying, no, it's not. No, it's not. Um, it seems that prostate cancer is probably more lipolytic than other cancers like glioblastomas, which is more glycolytic. So a ketogenic diet is not even a high protein diet, it's a high fat diet. So I wanna be very careful with that. I wouldn't put them on a, on a uh, keto diet. You know, long winded story just to tell you, don't put them on a keto diet. Uh, oops, vegetables, only leafy, leafy vegetables were found to be protective against advanced prostate cancer. Intake of all vegetables was associated with 33% reduction in risk of advanced prostate cancer. This was, uh, this protective effect was confined with yellow and green vegetables, cruciferous vegetables, et cetera, um, and carrots of uh, uh, carrot intake of fruit did not modulate the risk of advanced prostate cancer. Nothing against carrots, nothing against fruit, but it definitely seems that um, A, cruciferous vegetables is the way to go. B, 
um, mostly vegetables and some fruit is fine. Again, nothing to do with the sugar in food or anything like that. Um, but the vegetables um, is the way to go. Uh, All right, nutraceuticals. So uh, vitamin K2 was associated with lower risk of advanced prostate cancer. Remember what we're trying to do here. We're trying, they're on ADT likely if they have advanced prostate cancer. So we're trying to do things to um, lower, uh, reduce the risk of progression of prostate cancer. And we're trying to do things for them to, um, to minimize the side effects of ADT. Trying to do both, okay? So vitamin K2 associated with lower risk of advanced prostate cancer. Ooh, cool. What else does vitamin K2 does? Well, it helps you with bone health, actually. I use it even more than cal. I don't really use calcium in my practice for as a nutrient for bone health. I'll tell you why later. But I use vitamin K2, good for heart, uh, associated with lower risk of advanced prostate cancer in a study, and good for bone. I like that. Lycopene, which actually I don't use that much, um, not for any other reason. So if you want to use it in your patients, it's fine. And a European study showed that um, concert, higher concentrations were associated with 60% reduction in risk of advanced prostate cancer. Um, so lycopene might be good too. Um, it's just that there's so many things you can use and I have a strategy and there's a method behind my ma madness that I will tell you in a second. Here's what I'm trying to do to prevent uh, ADT toxicity. I'm trying to help them with cognition and memory. Any man will tell you their main concern is always, will I, you know, their, their memory loss. They, they are more afraid of that than death. Right. So what I use for memory is acetylcarnitine, bacopa, ashwagandha and lion's mane. I don't use phosphatidylcholine or anything with choline just in case choline might be a contributing factor. Right. So a lot of the brain supplements have phosphatidylcholine in it. I don't do it. I don't use that. I use these things. Bone health. I use um, boron, vitamin K2 and black cohosh, believe it or not. So black cohosh has shown in just in this will help with osteosporosis in both men and women. Physical energy, ashwagandha. I don't, as of late, and I could have taken this out, I don't use a lot of cordyceps. I do, I use mostly from the category of herbs called um, uh, adaptogens. So uh, rhodiola. Um, F, 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 uh, ashwagandha, a Siberian ginseng. Here's why in cordyceps, um, a lot of people are reading uh, this mouse study showing that cordyceps can, inc so I use cordyceps, for example, in men with low testosterone. It seems like it's it can help with increasing testosterone. And while nothing is stronger than an ADT drug, so is, if you take something, if you take an ADT drug, nothing, there's no herb that's going to I believe elevated, but it might interfere at least in some mouse studies that I uh, saw. So I don't recommend cordyceps because I recommend cordyceps physical energy in every other case and in, in men with um, low testosterone, um, among other things, but I don't recommend cordyceps a lot. So that um, you want to remove that. And for hot flashes, I do recommend uh, black cohosh and to eat more figs. My friend, uh, Alan Christensen, Dr. Alan Christensen wrote a book on hormones and uh, healing foods for hormones or hor the hormone, something like that. And so he recommends figs for, uh, for hot flashes. Um, uh, I think the research is on women, but uh, it has nothing to do with uh, an estrogenic element of it. Uh, it has to do with the area in the brain that controls temperature. But anyway. This is more or less my approach to prevent toxicity from ADT. Exercise. Name of the game is muscle mass. Weight resistant training and aerobic reduce fatigue and maintains muscle mass. Weight resistant training three times a week minimum. Now, in men with ADT, and you'll see that if you um, if you trying to get the uh, the PDF that I have, um, you'll see that. Um, in each category, the primary type of exercise changes. With ADT, the primary type of cha uh, uh, change is weight resistant training. We got to do it, and we have to um, we have to uh, sustain muscle mass. There's no other way. Um, and I have studies in that PDF. Um, that shows that men on ADT are able to retain muscle and even create 
uh, uh, even uh, uh, create a little bit more muscle, which is, you know, most men on ADT, their muscle mass de de is depleted very rapidly. Uh, if you do weight resistant exercise, you keep what you have, or you can actually still make some, which is pretty remarkable. And I think that if you add, you know, the right type of amino acids and things like that, even more so. There's a study, ongoing study on men on ADT. The results are not out yet. Weight with re weight resistant training and taking creatine. I think that creatine is a good thing for men on ADT. Five grams a day. All right, here's the summary. Overall summary of treatment protocol. Overall. Mediterranean plant-based diet can include skinless chicken, red meat, as long as it's not processed and not overly cooked. Intermittent fasting, I recommend. I discourage ketogenic diet for men with prostate cancer. Exercise four to six hours a week with at least three, hour, uh, three horses, no, no, three hours, with moderate to high intensity. High risk, while in ADT, I emphasize weight-resistant training um, about three times a week. Uh, nutraceuticals, um, micronutrients, vitamin E has to be high gamma tocopherol mixed in it, not just uh, not just DL alpha tocopherol, which is the synthetic since 20, when was that published? 2008, uh, the select trial, I'm not going to get into it, but anyway, suggests that vitamin E may increase the risk of prostate cancer. What they used there was DL alpha tocopherol. That's it, is a synthetic version. You don't want that. You want high D gamma tocopherol mixed with all the other tocopherols. So that's what you want. Vitamin C, uh, 500 to 1,000 milligrams a day. Uh, zinc, 15 to 16 milligrams a day. Selenium from selenized yeast, very important. Um, I don't use selenomethionine in supplement form because of that same select trial that showed increased risk in pro uh, prostate cancer in men who took selenomethionine. I use selen selenium from selenized yeast, the mixture of a few type of um, uh, types of selenium. Vitamin D3, omega-3 fatty acids. I use about between 2,000 and 4,000 milligrams a day, depending on what I'm trying to accomplish. Because at some point, even men on ADT who are already taking a lot more pills, because it's it becomes. I'm trying to also assess for pill exhaustion, right? Yes, I know that Nick Gonzalez, uh, God bless his soul, used to recommend 150 pills a day. That's a lot. And I'm trying to, I, the way I talk to my patients is this is the long game. It's not the short game. I want you to be consistent and um, stay on the protocol. So uh, depends what I'm trying to accomplish. So, but roughly about 400 milligrams a day. I use boron and magnesium for bone help uh, uh, if on ADT. And rarely recommend calcium because, you know, what I noticed with it, too much calcium is a problem, right? It's hardening, uh, hardens the arteries. If they have their prostate intact, there's calcification in the prostate. It's a problem. So I don't want them to consume too much uh, calcium. Plus, you get plenty from all the from the from the foods that they're eating. Um, so not too much calcium. Uh, all the others, boron, um, magnesium, uh, black cohosh, vitamin D three all help very nicely with uh, bone health. And by the way, you can have all the calcium you want and have it roaming around your bloodstream, but if you're not doing weight resistant training, that calcium is not going into the bone. Stressing the bone through weight resistant training and exercise is how you get calcium into the bone. So the most important thing for bone health is exercise and weight resistant training. Uh, botanicals, I use curcumin anywhere between 1,000 and 400, 4,000 milligrams. So if they do, if they are, have advanced prostate cancer with bone metastasis, now we're dealing with pain. And again, I am trying to get them active and to exercise, whatever it takes. So, and there's anti-cancer benefits from curcumin. So if they're on, uh, they have advanced disease with bone metastasis, that's where I go higher on the curcumin because there's a, anti-inflammatory and can actually help with the pain. If they um, have uh, active surveillance or something, I keep them at about a thousand milligrams a day. So it really depends on the situation. Med medicinal mushrooms, I like Ganodoma lucidium, lucidium, reishi mushroom quite a bit. 
um, just because, but that doesn't mean that the others are not good. Uh, uh, I know some of you use cordyceps. Again, I got men with advanced prostate cancer. Are just there's some studies that I can share with you if you want that show that you you want to be careful. But all the others are fine. It's just that Ganoderma Rishi seem to really have um, most of the evidence. So I use a lot of that. I use AHCC, uh, active hexose correlated compound. Um, so that's that. I add black cohosh if they use uh, ADT and bacopa for cognitive health if on ADT, about five milligrams a day. Others, andrographis, I use uh, about that dosage, broccoli extract with some level of uh, sulforaphane, green tea extract, grapeseed extract. I also use magnolia bark, by the way. It's not in here, but I use magnolia bark. And we just don't have that much time to go into it right now. That's for another presentation at some point. That's pretty much the, pro the, the protocol. Um, for the extensive exercise protocol, any of these platforms would, and, and you could, or you could just email me and I'll just send it right to you. I'm gonna leave this screen here. So I wanna thank you, first of all, and then I'm gonna put the screen here um, uh, so that you know where to reach me. And I'm, I'm ready for questions, Peter or Amy. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Gio, it was great. Thank you. There's so much material. I wish we had another hour, but we don't today. So do Sometime in the future. Um, can, Amy, before you start with reading off the questions, can I just get the ball rolling with one? Um, to, in your, in your write-up about the talk, you had mentioned uh, about misuse of PSA. And I wonder if you could say just a little bit more uh, mm. about that. You, what, what are you referring to when you talk about misuse or misperceptions about the PSA test? Misuse and abuse of the PSA test. Um, let's see, how do I summarize that? The advent of the PSA test for prostate cancer uh, was in the late 80s, early 90s. And it did do a very good job. So prior to the PSA test, most men who presented to the office um, had already, 40% uh, of men had already advanced prostate cancer. Okay. Then the PSA test came about and I said, well, that reduced the risk 10 years later to 4% of advanced prostate. So it did a good job in terms of preventing people from having uh, or dying from prostate cancer. What happened was that then uh, for the next 20 years or so, it was misused and abused. So PSA test elevated, which like the range is between zero, zero to four. That's ridiculous because many people are above four uh, and, uh, and that's, that's fine depending on age and many factors. Got biopsy, there are um, biopsies, uh, it is a invasive uh, procedure. Um, and then um, with for low risk disease, these Gleason sixes that I'm saying, hey, don't worry about it. You may not even have to worry about Gleason seven, three plus four. Everybody was getting surgery and so forth. And, and so the, you know, everybody. So now you have the side effects from the surgery, incontinence, sexual dysfunction, and so forth. All that from the PSA test. Um, in uh, 2014, give or take, losing track of time, uh, the United States Preventative Task Force said no more use of PSA for screening for prostate cancer because of this problem. And ultimately, what they care about, care about is healthcare costs, not only you know what's right for patients. So, what happened there is, and now the GPs and internal medicine docs were not ordering PSA. There again, we saw a higher um, we saw a higher risk of more advanced prostate cancer showing up to the clinic. The bottom line is that um, when I have a patient with presenting with a PSA that haven't been diagnosed, there's a protocol and a methodology to determine if indeed um, they should even get a biopsy. That, and that's a story for a different day, unfortunately. But bottom line is, is the PSA useful? I think it's very useful. But it's not, it's how you use it, not whether or not you should use it. So 
almost never do a patient shows up with a PSA that I say, you need a biopsy. I don't care if it's a six or a seven or eight. Let's go through the process. And part of the process is PSA velocity. Okay, is it eight today? What was it last time? What was it a year ago? Oh, it was a 7.5. Oh, okay, what was it a year before that? Oh, about a 7.2. Okay, so maybe you hang around sevens. Maybe you have a big prostate. Maybe you have an inflammation of your prostate. So let's look at that. Uh, but if they do come with a PSA of eight and they are, you know, 62 years old and a year ago it was a four doubled in a year, I said, all right, I won't freak out yet, but it doubled. So either you have prostatitis, so I'm looking for symptoms. You have burning when you pee or when you jack. I'm looking for prostatitis, something. Uh, maybe they get on an antibiotic or something and then it goes, you know, comes down or something. If it goes from a four to an eight in a year, 62 year old guy, and they have zero urinary symptom. No, I pee great. No, I, I have no my, good stream. Nope, no burning. Now I'm like, okay, we need to look into this. That's a, that's a big jump. So it's how you use PSA, not whether or not it should be used. I hope that answers your question, Peter. Good question. Yes. Okay. All right. So we have a lot of questions. So we might have to do this slightly like rapid fire if we want to get rapid there. fire. As you Ooh. notice, Amy, nothing is rapid fire coming That's from okay. me, but we'll try. We'll try. Yeah. No, it doesn't have to be super rapid, but I think we have All about right. 10 questions or so. So lots Jeez. of good questions. Um, the first one is just is near infrared light effective against prostate cancer? Um, infrared light. All right. Is infrared light helpful for prostate cancer? The way I, I would answer that and everything is I do look for evidence and I do understand that I'm, and not everything could be tested and everything and not everything I do is a hundred percent randomized trials, right? Cause you can't really do that, right? If you're going to, we're, we're in the trenches, but what I do suggest is out of all the things, there's a slew of things on the list in, in our world hyperbaric oxygen chambers, uh, IV vitamin C, uh, duh, 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 the, the lifestyle. Duh, 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 duh. I think we need to prioritize, guys. If not, we're going to lose our patients. And then we have to say, okay, what gives them the most bang for, for the buck that we know, right? And I don't know that infrared does that, that I know of, unless somebody can share something with me that's robust. So why do that, right? I'm not against it. I don't think it's harmful. But we need something to hold on to and say, yeah, you know what, that's a good idea. Look, IV vitamin C, I'll give you an example. I, I, you know, uh, Paul Anderson, friend of mine, does IV vitamin C for cancers, you know. Um, it's hard to say how beneficial it really is for prostate cancer. I think it's good for renal cancer, more evidence there. But I would say, look, if you're going to do it, it doesn't take you off the lifestyle approach that I know and the things that at least I know, then it's, I think it's fine. It might be helpful, but I can't, you know, I, I cannot um, prescribe it all the time because it's a lot. You know that you see these patients. There's only so much you can really prescribe at once. And you got to hit them hard specifically and, and be targeted for what they have. So um, infrared, um, you know, I, if they do everything and they want to do that, I don't think it's a problem, but it's not one of my primary go-tos. All right. Next question is, is berberine effective for treating prostate cancer? So I like, so the way I use berberine is if they have, if they're mismanaging their glucose and they're not a metformin or anything and so forth. So I use berberine for, for that. And, you know, one of the elements, one of the pillars, uh, or at least one of the things that I'm trying to address is uh, you know, um, excess high levels of glucose in the bloodstream and um, imbalances of insulin. So I think berberine in that scenario is good. I think it, there might be some in vitro or in vivo studies with berberine and prostate cancer, but there are a lot of studies with, you know, in vivo studies uh, that seem, so I can't, I don't go only by that a lot. Most of the studies that I presented, if not all are on humans. Um, so that's what I try to go by. So in summary, only they are mismanaging their glucose level, their glucose is too high or insulin levels are too high, do I uh, prescribe berberine? Great. Um, so the next question is, for low-risk cancers, you use all of the supplements listed or is this for advanced? 
It must be from one of your slides. For lower risk prostate cancer, I use, um, I use, um, how about this? If you email me, I'll tell you exactly, because it's not just what's there. What I try to do in this presentation is A, not, it's not a presentation. I don't have a week or three hours. I wanted to summarize it based on the best available, available evidence that I know. Um, but you have to think a little bit outside the box. So if you email me and you put on the subject line, low risk prostate cancer protocol for supplements, I will send that to you. Great. Sounds good. And I put your email in the chat already because some people were having troubles getting their emails into the website. So, oh, okay, I cool. Thank you. Copy it off of your website and put it in the chat so you can find yeah. that in the chat. Thank you. Um, so, next question is Are you prescribing the nutraceuticals while they're receiving radiation therapy or after oh. treatment? Oh, now that's a fascinating question. Um, there are that's I've given lectures on supplementation, dietary supplements, and radiation for prostate cancer. So that's a whole lecture. What I would say is that some supplements, and so the reason why that question is provocative is because radiation oncologists will say stay off the supplements during radiation in fear that um, the supplements, right? So radi how radiation works is it creates oxidative stress. So radiation oncologists, right? So they kills the DNA through oxidative stress. Um, radiation oncologists are thinking, well, we don't want these antioxidants in the system because that's gonna protect the cancer cells from the radiation. I'm saying nothing. I mean, how can 500 milligrams of vitamin C protect this high beam radiation coming to the, oh yeah, so this vitamin C has these right in front of the cancer cells. They, it's just not possible. Okay. So I presented this to a group of radiation oncologists thinking that, you know, they're going to throw tomatoes at me. And what it turns out, what, what, what the outcome was that they actually were very, uh, actually, they were very, uh, they asked great questions. And many of them say, well, I'm going to change my tune. All that to say that they're, I do keep them off of heavy duty antioxidants only to not confuse them and not to have to have conversations with their radiation oncologists. I do have them on things like probiotics, melatonin, and curcumin. And there's evidence to show that there's benefit there uh, in many ways. So I'll leave it there. Uh, through drgeo.com, when the website is up, I have a whole article on it. And I also have, um, I write about these things all the time. So if you become part of that and subscribe to that, you're gonna get probably more information that you want on prostate cancer and these type of uh, protocol. So that's a good question. Hope that helped. All right, so the next question um, is, at what phase of prostate cancer do you use the protocol that you presented? Or what stage? Uh, yeah. The protocol that I presented, well, I think in many of them, I said, look, on ADT, you do this, right? On, on the, the main difference between, let's say, low risk and post post um, treatment is really the addition of agaricus to reduce the risk of recurrence, the mushroom. I may add AHCC. Low risk, I'm just at low risk. The, the, the protocol is very basic. And typically things that also can have cardiovascular benefits. Why cardiovascular? Because it's the number one killer in the world. These guys will die from a heart attack before they die from prostate cancer. So I'm not trying to look, just look at the trees and not look at the forest. Um, so, and then the exercise kind of, so it depends. And in terms of the wiggle room with the diet is also depends on, on, on what stage, right? So, you know, it's typically plant-based Mediterranean with, with the inclusion of fish. I give them cheat days and days to cheat and everything. The guys with advanced prostate cancer, they have a little bit less wiggle room, but they also get wiggle room. And I want them to consume um, protein um, 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 more so than I am concerned with the guy. With, they're all gonna consume some level of protein, but I wanna make sure that the guys on ADT really get the right amino acids in. So that's kind of the basic overview of how the, each patient from each category 
is um, uh, the protocols that I use for each category. Great. All right. The next one is recommendation for, do you have a recommendation for brands for selenized yeast? Yeah. Based oh. millennia. <laughs> so I, I have to jump in. We're not really allowed to do that brands, you know, oh, on, on our presentations, but why don't you email that question to Dr. Gio and let him answer the email? That would be fine. Okay. All right. Um, you didn't mention- By the way, give me, give me, I already see the emails coming in. You need to give me a couple of days. I see like, there's like a thousand emails coming in. I love it. I'm here for you, but it's only one of me. And so I'll, I'll make sure to get the information out to you guys. Okay. And ladies. Perfect. Um, you didn't mention dairy. I hear it's not good yeah. for prostate cancer. Any thoughts on it? Yeah, good point. Yeah. Um, um, yeah, I, I I discourage them from having dairy. I don't know if it's the casein or the fat. Uh, I think that the research shows that even low fat is a problem. So um, that said, um, if they say, look, I have my coffee, just a drop of cream, that's just a drop. I'm not taking that away because that drop of cream is not going to do anything. I do discourage them to ha from having milk. I mean, what do you have? Well, milk and cheese, I mean, and then we talk about, you know, cheese a little bit more, but um, in terms of just milk, I mean, what, what do you have milk, milk, a cup of milk, cereal? Well, you shouldn't have cereal anyway. So, um, so oftentimes it's with their tea or with their, with their coffee. So I, I don't take that away as long as it's really just a little bit. Um, and with cheese, I ask them to really modify. Look, I think that the biggest dietary component I find the where we start before we get into the specifics is eat less and do intermittent fasting. I think the main problem is that people are eating too much, including men, and I think that's a big prostate cancer risk. So eat less, and then we hone in on what to eat and when, and in parties and in events, at steak dinners with the guys, and all these things. Do you buy into the notion of taking periodic breaks in supplements? I don't. I, I need to see really good evidence. Um, and I understand the logic behind cancer cells become immune to it or this or that, or uh, I don't know that that's true. I know that, that that's a methodology with um, that's used with medical, some medical treatments. So I don't because um, I, the things that I, again, I'm, I'm always looking and, and it's, uh, I'm always looking and, and I'm always thinking, how am I actually, yeah, I, I don't know. I've seen, I don't know, 3,000 patients with prostate cancer, I guess, uh, in the thousands. And rather than saying, wow, his PSA dropped, wow, I'm such a great doctor. Um, unfortunately, that's not what I do. I, I think of what am I getting wrong here? You know, I'm always thinking, what am I getting wrong? Or I know three patients in my 20 year career that died from prostate cancer, despite what I now they already came to me with advanced disease and so forth. I want to hit home runs all the time. Well, I know three patients that are always in my mind that I did not. I'm like, what did I, I so he bit, helped, you know, treated 3,000 of them, three that I know, and those are the ones that are in my mind all the time. So I'm always thinking of these things. Um, so until I see other evidence, I want these, I want curcumin and all these anti-cancer things in their bloodstream um, all the time. Um, and again, it's not like it's just the drug or the supplement, the exercise. Um, and the food, what are you gonna say? Not eat, you know, not, not eat the cruciferous fish because, right. Cause it's all the same. We're trying to, you know, we're using dietary supplements, like medications that let's be honest, right? Like, sure. Hopefully there's no HIPAA, uh, not a HIPAA, but the uh, government is not listening. Right. Cause we don't, we shouldn't say these things, but we are doing that. Um, so, um, but same thing we're doing with, with, with food, I mean, and, and so forth. So until I see that more evidence, um, I'll keep doing this, but I'm I'm always thinking of that. That's a great question. Thank you for asking. Is CBD oil a beneficial supplement for advanced patients that already have metastases? I don't know. Um, I have an article on that as well, and it's like it's uh, now when you look at in vitro, there's a lot of CBD um, components that seem to cause regression of prostate cancer cells. So that's that. Um, if patients are saying, look. I, uh, I want you I'll, put me on this protocol. I have this type of prostate cancer. I already take CBD. I don't take them off. I think, you know, I, I stay on it. 
or if they're having problems with sleeping, um, then I some level of CBD oil with a little bit of th even THC uh, uh, to some degree. Um, I just want them to get the best sleep possible. So, and if there's anti-cancer benefits from there, great. Like guys on ADT, right? They just have, they have, they struggle with sleeping because of hot flashes and things. So I'm, one of the pillars in my work is sleep. So I want to get them to sleep. So if CBD oil helps them with that, then we go for it. Great. Um, what about PSMA therapy? Um, can you do same supplement? Uh, I'm not sure if I understand the question fully. Maybe I understand it if you read it okay. out because even PSMA, I understand what they're trying to okay. say. Okay, it just says, what about PSMA therapy? And then in parentheses, theranostics, nuclear therapy, and then period, can you do same supplements? Right. So PSMA therapy, my, what I think they're, so um, for advanced prostate cancer, there's this um, actually brand, well, new here in the U.S., just approved less than a year ago called Pulvicto for advanced prostate cancer. In essence, they get a PSMA PET scan, very specific PET scan, best PET scan for prostate cancer is PSMA. If they find prostate cancer anywhere in the body, there's a, they, they use um, a drug um, that finds that those cells through the PSMA and tries to kill those cancer cells. The name of the drug is Plavicto, Dr new drug. So what supplements can be used with Plavicto? I'm assuming that's the question. And the answer is, I don't know. I use my protocol with men right now. Plavicto is too new and I can't see any downside from it. So stay tuned. I don't really know, but I use a similar protocol that I already use with patients. What about um, ozone therapy? There is another one. So where do you go? So where do you, you know, where do you go? Right? So you only have but so much time and so many resources. What do you do? Um, downside, I don't think there's any upside probably. And I know it's used for cancer therapies. Again, this is prostate cancer, right? Can't, all cancers, you know, Gerson therapy, you know. Oh, you know, cured from prostate cancer with Gerson. Well, was it a low risk disease? Because, I mean, you can breathe on it and that cures low risk disease, you know. So, uh, you know, it, uh, you have to prioritize and target it. Ozone, again, if they say, look, I'm going to, I heard, I read that is, I'm going to do it. No problem. Go for it. But do I recommend it? No, not yet. I need to see a little bit more or see something before I recommend it. The protocols that I recommend are, first of all, I've seen, you know, biopsy, get on my get on a protocol, second biopsy, negative biopsy. I've seen that in my practice. I've seen a recurrence after a prostatectomy. PSA goes up, 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 up. And the guys are resisting. I'm not going to do ADT or radiation. I get on a protocol. It dips for the first time ever and throughout that time has been up. So I've seen that. Um, so those are the things that are intriguing to me, uh, the things that the patient can have some level of control over with their lifestyle. Perfect. Good. And I think we're at time now. So I'll let Peter go ahead and close us out. But thank you so much. And I'm so sorry if I didn't get to your questions. I know there's a few we didn't uh, get to read out loud, but thank you everyone for your participation and for asking yeah. questions. Thank you very much. Yeah, I had a good time with you guys. Thank you. Thank you so much again, Gio. Um, I just wanted to uh, mention to everybody that next month we're going to have um, another integrative oncology topic, but it's going to be a panel. Um, and we're going the topic is pers perspectives on the practice of integrative oncology. So it's practice oriented rather than clinically oriented. And it's going to be a panel that will offer insights into the challenges and opportunities and prospects of the field from a broad range of educational and clinical perspectives. We have four great panelists, don't have time to list them now, but um, that leads into, Amy, can you put into the chat how to um, get on our email list? Sure, absolutely. Actually, probably the fastest way to do that is just to find us on Facebook. Um, it's uh, Integrative Cleveland. And you'll find us there. And then uh, the it's pinned at the top to join our email list. So um, that's probably the fastest way because most people will probably close out of this chat relatively soon. And, and then uh, 
you'll be able to get our newsletter with all the descriptions of events. <clears throat> and um, I guess that is about it. <laughs> um, again, you'll receive a link for the, for the um, recording, but um, I think it's also going to be just available on the AIHM um, YouTube channel. So um, thank you again, everybody, for coming. I hope you found this valuable. There's so many things we didn't get to tonight, not just the questions, but other things. But we uh, can we invite you back again on another occasion, Dr. Gio? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Um, um, I mean, I'm always in danger of overcommitting, but the truth is that um, I'm trying to get this word out there as it relates to prostate and the work that I do, right? I have a narrow specialty. Um, you don't, after you do the same thing over and over and over again, it's like, okay, you get, you get it. And I want to make sure that people have, um, um, I get a lot of referrals from a lot of people all over the place. I'm humbled for that, but I think that the, the practitioner can see male patients. They can, they see, they can see prostate cancer patients, not be afraid of that and so forth. So I want to teach that so that, um, you don't need to send them to me though. I love to see them, but you can keep them. Okay, thank you so much again, everybody. Thank you for coming, and um, good night. We'll see you soon. Good night. Thanks. Thanks so much. Thank you.